happened with the consecrations? Well, through through I was I was off in the United States in eighty two. I was away from Acone. I was away from the drama drama in Europe. I didn't know all that. I was no longer directly involved over in Europe, but I was over in the United States. The Archbishop followed serenely on his path. Just. And he gathered more and more, he f ordained more and more priests, he gathered more and more faithful following him in the outward, the out, outrider priories which he was founding with his young priests. And so there was a whole movement building all over the world. The Archbishop himself, like a good missionary, would travel, he would travel himself all over the world to visit and encourage Catholics. I remember going down with him to South Africa in 1981. It was a great privilege. And we visited groups that I'd set up the, a, a couple of previous years amongst the South African Catholics. And everywhere in the world there was this reaction in favor of the old religion, puzzlement and distress at the new religion. And the Archbishop was the natural solution. And he would go and con give conferences and reassure them. And inevitably, whenever, wherever he went, things would, would flourish, flourish, tradition would flourish behind him. He was building tradition all over the world. Uh, Rome can't have been happy with this. This is, this is tradition, the old religion, which has to be stamped out because by, Paul, uh, by a man like Paul VI, because... Paul VI is set heart and soul upon reconciling the Catholic Church with the modern world. He's going to put them together, which you may remember the, the lad that, that uh, went, went, ahead of the, went ahead of me in the church in Polgate, and who's now, I said to you, a novice older bishop, he said he was happy with this reconciliation. But in fact... The, the two, what is at stake, you cannot reconcile. You can't mix oil and water. You can shake them furiously in one bottle together, but the moment you stop shaking, the, the water, um, the oil rises and the water falls, and they just separate quite neatly. The, the, the new religion, the old religion, are at loggers, they're at war. There's no other way of putting it. That's the reality of the content of the two religions. One is centered on God and the other is centered on man. It's completely different. So, and the, this man-centered religion puts man first and the God-centered religion puts God first. It's, it's chalk and cheese. It's not mixable. So the new religion has to stamp out the old religion. And that's why, you know, the, religion, the new religion can tolerate Buddhism, Mohammedanism, Talmudism, uh, uh, Hinduism, you name it. And it does tolerate them in Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II. But the old religion it can't tolerate because it's like a, f a mathematics fair where you've got a brilliant new stall being set up, a two and two, play it, and two and two equals five stall. And um, there's two and two is ten, two and two is twenty, two and two is six, two and two is six million. Uh, but there's this two and two and four, is four stall. Sooner or later, the two and two of four stall is going to put all the others out of business. So he, the archbishop had to be put out of business. So he was constantly harassed during these years, uh, during the, the 1980s, while the the youngsters in the society were flo the liberals were floating towards the top like scum. I'd have to say, uh, I, I mean, I'd think of the comparison with scum, how scum floats to the top of the water. But it's not a very, let's say, how cream floats to the top of milk. That's a little nicer. That's being nice. <laughs> so anyway, because of course cream floats to the top of milk. Anyway, um, he was hammered during the 1980s and he simply stood up to it and said, look, this is what the old religion says. This is what the new religion says. It's not compatible. This is not Catholicism. I want to die a Catholic, and I don't want to die a Protestant. He was, he was unanswerable. They, they, so they had to crush him, and they couldn't. They had to swallow him down, and they couldn't. He stuck in their throat. As the Archbishop neared the end of his life, he conceived of Operation Survival in order to guarantee the continued ordination of traditional priests. 
Could you tell us why the Acone Episcopal consecrations of 1988 were necessary? In 1988, he must have been 83. He was coming close to dying. He felt death coming, and he knew that if he didn't leave the society with, archbishop, with bishops, the priests alone couldn't survive. The bishops are the pivot of the church. They are the ones that can make be, be, uh, priests or a bishop can, can consecrate bishops, but a priest can do neither. So without, without bishops, the, the society was doomed to die. So he said to Rome, look, I'm going to ordain bishops. Rome might have tolerated him if he'd not ordained uh, consecrated bishops, because Rome knew, just as well as the archbishop knew, that if he didn't uh, leave bishops to, to, uh, to behind him, the, arch, the society would die, and that all that Rome wanted was for the society to die, with all its seminaries and with all its priories. So um, what happened then was that there was no negotiations were opened. And the Archbishop tried to get Rome to do its duty, to look after Catholic tradition. If Rome wants to also have all kinds of nonsense, that's Rome's problem. But Rome must at least also look after traditional Catholics, because that's the true faith. So Rome said, look, the Archbishop said, look, you've got to look up tradition. And Rome said, well, maybe you can join, we'll, we'll fix up a traditional committee and you will have three members and Rome will have seven or some, you know, some, some equivalent figures. In other words, Rome will dominate the operation and, and you will not be able to stand up independently for tradition. You will be, you will be essentially under the control. Of, tradition will be essentially under the control of Rome. And the Archbishop said, I can't do that. If you won't give us bishops, I'm, go I'm going to have to take them. He, the, Rome agreed in principle with one bishop, but the archbishop knew that more were necessary. So he decided on three, and then he added Bishop Foley, and that was a fourth. So there were four bishops he was going to consecrate. Uh, the day after the, pre the annual priestly ordinations, there would be the consecration of bishops. And uh, there were four of us. He, I remember he gave us a brief kind of a brief retreat beforehand and his, ex, his, his presentation of the situation of the church was absolutely, in my opinion, absolutely accurate, just real. This is the reality. He didn't get worked up about it. He didn't get passionate. He didn't get he wasn't worried. He just said, this is how it is. This is the situation what you're going to, that you're going to face. This is what you're going to have to deal with. And here is how to deal with it. Don't ordain lightly, and so on and so on. He gave essential advice. That. So we, we were consecrated on the end of June 1988. And that, of course, precipitated excommunication by Rome. So in theory, the Archbishop and Bishop de Castromai, who at that point joined him, Again, it was providential. There was one bishop who, after he retired, a Brazilian bishop, after he retired, felt free to be able to add his signature to the archbishops on some of the archbishop's documents where the archbishop attacked Rome for betraying the faith. And the second bishop added his signature. And then for the seminary of the consecrations, Bishop de Castromaya came as well and attended, came all the way from Brazil. He's an old man also, like Archbishop Levet, an old man. And he flew, made all the journey to Acon, and he stood by the archbishop's side at the ceremony, and he also laid hands and, on the bishops, which, which made sure of the validity, because in case the archbishop was, abs was absent-minded for a moment, the other bishop would, would also, it was it guaranteed. And the archbishop was very happy with that, with the presence of archbishop, of bishop Castromai, because it was the proof that he wasn't just cooking the whole thing out of his own head. Archbishop, Archbishop de Castromar gave a very brief, a brief but very good speech in which he said, I would have considered it a mortal sin if I had not come here to be at the Archbishop's side for this ceremony. Because this is the religion I learnt, this is the religion I practised, this is the religion that must survive. That's more or less what he said. And the Archbishop was very grateful. And the six of us, four, four new, priests, new bishops, and the two old bishops, we were all of us excommunicated, in inverted commas. If you look at canon law, it's not difficult to prove that it was invalid. An excommunication is either 
uh, by bell, book and candle, a formal ceremony or automatic, automatic according to canon law. Okay. Firstly, there was no formal ceremony. Secondly, according to canon law, the it was not an excommunication that was the fitting punishment for what the Archbishop had done. That's easy to prove. Um, we, we, let's not go into it unless you wish. Uh, so the Archbishop again paid no attention to the excommunication. He was very happy because he no longer had to travel as a bishop and look after all of these ceremonies of confirmation or nation all over the world. Uh, it was a great weight off his shoulders. He had entrusted he entrusted the society to a superior general, Father Schmidberger, uh, who would not be a bishop, but who would be the superior general of the four bishops, and the four bishops who would confer, confirm and ordain, above all, the two bishop sacraments uh, all over the world, amongst the four of them, and so on. And the Archbishop said, I'm giving them no jurisdiction, I'm not setting up an, an emergency church, I'm simply setting up, so to speak, an emergency lighting system in the crisis of electricity, in the blackout of the faith. I'm setting up an emergency lighting system. So the four bishops were then on their own. The, uh, two and a half years later, the Archbishop died, um, a venerable death, uh, and he, was, he th saw and thought, I would say, more clearly than ever in those last two and a half years, because he was no longer trying to play footsie with these criminal Romans. Criminal is not an exaggeration. They were betraying the faith, and God will have been giving them the graces to realize it, because they were and are to this day the real authority in the church. But they're not behaving like they're not fulfilling the function of Catholic authority, which is to protect Catholic truth. They are betraying Catholic truth, and they must be knowing it. Because, for instance, the, the Pope Paul VI or, or John XII, the second, they would have had little old ladies coming up to them and saying, "Holiness, Holiness." My boy is in one of your seminaries and he's losing the faith. He's not just losing his vocation, he's losing the faith. Ooh, the little old grandmother. It, it would, they would have had graces like that. Authentic, authentic, obviously authentic appeals of the genuine faith. And of course they just brushed it. They must have been brushing aside all of these definite graces. There must have been these graces. God is not abandoning his church, nor is he abandoning these, these, these felons. He's trying to get them back to their senses before they die, so that they don't go to have, to have to go to hell with a terrible eternity for having destroyed the church and destroyed and sent to hell millions of souls. God was trying to, but no, they just brushed it aside. They aren't intellectuals, they don't understand. We understand the absolute need to fit together oil and water, and we're going to do it. Give it a try, but it won't work. And it hasn't worked. And all the time it's not working. The new religion is not working. It's just the evidence is piling in all the time. The old religion is in dead trouble because it hasn't got the authority that it needs. And therefore the old religion is falling into fragments all the time, but it's continuing. It may be fragmented, it may be unauthoritative, it may be not structured, it may be the resistance, as it's so called, or the fidelity, as they call it in France, may, be, may leave a great deal to, desired, to be desired. Maybe a number of the priests do go crazy, like I can, I could name a few, but I won't, uh, because they haven't got a proper normal Catholic authority above their heads. They they follow the truth, which is very good, but without that authority, they can't hold on to the truth. They go into sadivacantism or back into liberalism. So the 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 the, the resistance, quote unquote, may be a sorry affair, but it has to exist. It has, and it is existing, and God is maintaining it against all the odds. He's even maintaining the society to quite an extent so that the society will be able to go on looking after a lot of souls who without the society, if they had only the novice order, would lose the faith. So Almighty God, with a variety of, uh, on the menu, you know, if anybody walks through the, into the Catholic restaurant, they find all the waiters and all the customers f throwing custard pies at one another, but somewhere it's going to be the group of Catholics 
or half Catholics or quarter Catholics who were going to look after their faith. And the church is continuing. So, you know, you can say what you like about the faults of the SSPX, the faults of, of the resistance, the faults of... You say what you like. Humanly speaking, the, church, the Catholics are, are, are in real distress because they haven't got the authority that they need. God has given us back a voice of that authority from one who was once number 11 in the church, Archbishop Vigano. And Archbishop Vigano is telling it absolutely straight and absolutely clear. And he's not saying, oh, COVID is politics. We mustn't talk about politics. We're spiritual, spelt with two W's, spiritual. Oh, namby pambies. That's what I would call them. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, the church today is in, is in a mess. It's in a horrible mess. But Almighty God is making sure that it survives in this very unusual and uncatholic way. But it is surviving. And it will be there, all of, this, all, of the, all, the, all of the waiters and customers throwing custard pies at another will be still there when he brings back authority, which he will do. I don't know when, you don't know when, none of us knows when. F two years, five years, seven years, between now and then, there's going to be a huge chastisement. That it, can, can't, it surely can't be avoided any longer. Uh, but so that's the drama of the consecrations. And that's the, that's the beginning of the drama ever since the consecrations. The consecrations marked a real, you know, it was the mountaineers driving the piton into the rock. And that, that really held. It held for 20 years before it began to fall apart, fall apart. But those 20 years were pretty good, were of expansion of the society again, more and more expansion. And by the end of those 20 years, let's say by then that would be put us into 2008 would be 20 years. By 2008, 2018, tradition was re-established, had its seat again in the church. It had been absolutely condemned by Paul VI. Paul VI pretended it was absolutely condemnable. John Paul II was maybe a little easier, but not much more favorable, not much more favorable. Um, and John Paul II was absolutely convinced of the new religion and happy with it. Um, Benedict XVI is happy with the new religion. And he's another one that tried to fit things together. He and Bishop Fully tried to put oil and water together in 18... And what am I saying? In 20, 2016? No, no, earlier. 29, 2009. 2008, 2009. They were trying to put oil and water together. But then um, an idiot from England had been talking about the uh, six million in, uh, in Germany and uh, the, the bad guys launched, uh, ignited that bomb just at the right moment to stop Bishop Foley and Benedict XVI.